Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to SRI's daily global COVID-19 conversations. Today, we are going to talk to our friends from ICFJ about their health reporting initiative that's really a global, important, critical initiative and project. Right now, you are listening to and seeing the outdoor camera on my wife Rupa's phone so that you can hear a little bit of the cheers that come in at this time. Please share this conversation with friends and family. Please tag them. This is the time to bring them in. We are going to have a great conversation about journalism, about healthcare, about health reporting. This is your chance to do so. And you can also notice how empty New York is at the moment. And we are catching as much as we can of the city. And we'll also, you're looking from the Upper West Side onto Midtown Manhattan, as you can see there, and some of those very tall buildings. And then off to the right, you can see the Hudson River and New Jersey. And you can see that, and that's where that sunset is. Very, very beautiful. I want to thank my most wonderful camera person, Rupa. Three master's degrees, and this is what she's doing. And just very grateful to her. Thank you all for being here. Let me tell you about our show today. We have a fantastic conversation around the ICFJ Health Crisis Reporting Forum. And we are going to meet Patrick Butler and Stella Rock, who are from ICFJ. We're going to explain this very important project that is helping so many journalists around the world. As always with our conversations, we have the opportunity to bring you people who support us, in this case, our sponsors. And before we do that, a reminder, please go on to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and share this conversation right now. Please tag a friend somewhere in the world who would benefit from being in this conversation. Just hit share or retweet on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on YouTube. Please do share and tag your friends. Bring them on into this conversation. Our sponsor is FrontlineFoodTrucks.com, Frontline Food Trucks, which is a terrific organization bringing food to the workers at NYU Langone and other hospitals. They have sponsorship from La Colombe, Sweet Green, Chobani, Kind Bar, and that way they are able to bring the, the workers food at a very critical time. The cafeterias have closed. So you can go to frontlinefoodtrucks.com and make a donation. And if you make a donation, you're supporting three things. You're supporting this little show, you're supporting food truck workers, and you're supporting hospital workers. I should note that the this ad was paid for by an anonymous third party donor. So this is an easy way for you to see that the money was coming from a donor and not taken out of the hands of the frontline food trucks or of the hospital workers. And we have uh, many opportunities for you to support this show by becoming a sponsor. You can see how inexpensive this is for small businesses, nonprofits, and individuals. Maybe you have nothing that you want to promote, but you have a nonprofit that you love. This is your chance to show some love to a nonprofit. Maybe wish somebody happy birthday, make a marriage proposal. You can do all this in this global conversation. This is an informal way for me to make sure that I can pay for freelance producers to help make this show a better show. So let me bring on our guests so that you can say hello to them. We have two fabulous guests tonight. I also want to thank our two producers who are helping me. Uh, they are live tweeting the show and help putting it together. Vandana Menon is Vandana underscore Menon on Twitter, V-A-N-D-A-N-A, -A -A, Vandana Menon on Twitter. And Rose Horowitz is Rose Horowitz 31. And let's see if we also have some folks joining us. Jonathan Borstein here. He's always here first. Greetings from the East Village. Paula Kiger is here from Tallahassee, Florida. And Courtney is here. Bonjour, she says. She's married 
to a Frenchman and used to live in Paris, but she is in Tucson right now, and she's a former guest of the show. She was on the Sunday Night Positivity Show, and I left very positive after that. So definitely do say hello to her. So now let me bring on Patrick Butler and Stella Rock. How are you folks? We're great. How are you, Sri? It's a pleasure to be with you. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Peggy is watching from Taiwan. And Tanya says, you're my new favorite TV. Oh my goodness, that is so kind. And we really appreciate that. Many people have written in saying how much they love the show and what they're learning. And some people have used the word uplifting. Someone said a lifeline. And I say to all of you, you are giving me a lifeline. You are helping me by letting me come into your lives every day for an hour and talk about something around the COVID-19 crisis. I'm going to ask everybody to make sure they have shared, retweeted, and posted about this show, and just tag friends. Anyone who's a journalist in the world would benefit from watching the show right now to hear about the ICFJ Forum. So let me start with each of my guests. Uh, Patrick, tell us where you are and how you are, and same thing with Stella, and then Patrick will explain to us what the ICFJ is, what it does, and why it matters. Well, thank you, Sri. I am in Washington, D.C., uh, at home, as many of us are, and uh, doing pretty well, actually. I'm uh, relieved that uh, myself and my family are healthy, um, but I'm also relieved that, that unlike many people, I have a job, and, and so I get to uh, keep working, and I'm, I'm certainly aware that that's not true for so many people, so I feel particularly lucky. Stella, where are you? I'm also in Washington, D.C., and... I have to say, it's been an interesting ride, kind of learning to do things, do everything from home, really, like learning to work from home, not going out as much and doing the things that I usually love doing. So I'm also well and healthy, so I'm very thankful for that. And similar to Patrick, I'm very thankful that I have a job right now while a lot of Americans are out of work. Yeah, thank you both. Now tell us about ICFJ, what it is and why it matters. Thanks. Uh, so the International Center for Journalists has been working for uh, more than 35 years all over the world. Pretty much we've been in almost every country. We, I always say virtually every country except North Korea. And we're working to help journalists do their work better. And it's never been more clear than it is right now how important the work of journalists is, because we are the way that people are getting information about how to stay healthy, what to do if something goes wrong, you know, uh, where, what, what is happening in our public health systems so that we can hold our governments to account to make sure that they are doing everything they can to protect us. Um, our unofficial motto is it takes a journalist and we really believe that. Uh, if you want to improve health around the world, it takes a journalist. It takes a journalist to tell people how to live healthier lives. If you want to stop corruption, it takes a journalist. It takes journalists to reveal what our governments are doing when they're maybe not doing something so well. If you want to uh, you know, improve the environment, whatever it is, it takes a journalist to get those missions done. So that's kind of our, our focus. And we're really obviously 100% uh, uh, focused on, on the pandemic right now and what we can do to help journalists better cover it. And I think Stella is gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing in that area. Yeah, absolutely. When we heard about the spread of COVID-19, we were kind of, well, first of all, it's like we saw this epidemic growing and it was beginning to travel across to different countries. Uh, government responses were all very different. And from ICFJ's headquarters in Washington, D.C., we realized that we absolutely needed to respond to this somehow. We realized that as it, as it started growing and spreading across borders that we had to do something, especially for the community of journalists. And we thought, well, isn't this a great moment? It, like, it's tragic in one sense because of the disease, but isn't it a great moment to actually interconnect journalists so they can talk to each other? And one thing we kind of figured out, we made a call out to Twitter and even to our own network at ICFJ, and we asked them, well, what do you guys need at this time? Like, what's going on in your countries, especially where the pandemic was hitting the hardest? And we got a lot of responses. We had some people tell us that the governments weren't sharing information with them. Some reporters didn't have any experience reporting on health before, and they were like, well, how do we, how do we cover this? And you know, what's the science behind it? 
So we realized we needed to connect journalists to the science and health experts to help inform them on the issue of corona of the novel coronavirus. And we also needed to get reporters talking to each other, not just to debunk disinformation, but also to potentially collaborate on cross-border projects and stories. So the idea of creating an online space where they could all interconnect sort of was formed from that. And that's why we launched the Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. We'll show that to the forum in just a second, but we want to just remind people of where and what they should be looking for. So tell us about the main website and what all you'll find on there, and then we'll go into the forum. Well, ICFJ has really two main websites. Our, our first one is icfj.org, which you can see here right now. Uh, this is uh, uh, basically an announcement we made yesterday. We're very excited uh, about the forum because we have more than 2,500 journalists and health experts, uh, people who are working in technology all over the world who are participating in the forum. But we are now going to expand it to three new languages, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. So we'll be have separate forums in each of those languages, and people can, can participate in webinars, they can share information with their colleagues, they can uh, you know, share resources that would be helpful. So that's what you're seeing right there. The other one a website that we have is called IJNet, the International Journalist Network. And if you click on that picture to the right there uh, with the group gathered around a, a computer, you'll, you'll, you'll go to that website. This is our website that really is for journalists everywhere in the world. And it's uh, basically provides you with all the toolkits, all the tip sheets, all the trend stories, everything you can think of that could help you cover this pandemic, but but obviously uh, we've been running IJNet for more than 20 years, so it's more than just the pandemic. Sri, you've been on this uh, site many times, whether you knew it or not. So um, we have lots of resources. It's in seven languages, and we're about to expand to an eighth. So we have this IJNet site in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, Persian, Russian, and Chinese, with French about to be added. So that's going to really help us reach places in Francophone Africa and the Caribbean that we weren't really able to reach before. So those are our two websites. And then uh, we'd love to show you the, the forum on Facebook as well. So you can sure, see we'll, what we're doing there. Sure, we'll, we'll get to that. Let's just see some of the comments coming in. Stacey Horn, you'd be a great guest. Uh, Courtney is tagging folks. Uh, Courtney is also tagging in French. Uh, her friend Ali, uh, Alice, everyone should do this. They can tag and share with their friends. And ICFJ staff has gone in and put into Facebook the exact links. That's a right, useful uh, way to uh, make use of this particular forum. So that's terrific. And what a great resource is Courtney. And uh, I see FJ has also gone in and put in the, the links, the specific links on Facebook. So you can do that. You can see that on Twitter as well. And Courtney is also checking, uh, is tagging James Ledbetter. We love that. Someone on Twitter said, we appreciate your efforts and says, should the USA build that wall? And I would say, uh, given the state of how America was doing, maybe other countries will build a wall to keep Americans out uh, more than uh, the other way around. And Courtney's tagging, she doesn't know, my old friend and my former student, Chris Albritton, who's an international journalist. So we like that. And Christy says, thank you for your broadcast. So everyone, please hit share right now. Please tag your friends. We want everybody to be able to learn from this. And you can follow Patrick at KeyButler50 and Stella Rock, Stella S R O Q U E, and ICFJ and IJNet. They're all on Twitter. Follow them. Go to their website. Please get involved and uh, show them uh, the love that they need. They need love and they need support also, right, Patrick? Oh, sure. We'd, we'd be happy to receive support. Uh, a lot of what we're doing now on the pandemic is is not not funded. It's just work that we know is important. So we're doing it. And uh, just tell us a little bit more about ICFJ. What is the funding? Uh, how big is the board? How big is the organization? And how are you weathering the storm? Yeah, we're um, so we're talking about funding. We are mostly privately funded. Most of our funders, our biggest funders, are foundations like the Knight Foundation, of course, a big supporter of journalism initiatives. Um, also, Luminate is sponsoring a former part of the well, part of the Omidyar Network is sponsoring a big project we're doing on sustainability for media organizations. Something I think we'll talk about probably on tonight's show. Um, we also have some U.S. government funding from the State. State Department and USAID 
to, you know, for example, doing investigative reporting programs in uh, Latin America and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union uh, and many other programs. We have corporate funding from Google, Facebook, et cetera. Bloomberg is another major funder. Uh, in the, the expansion that I just talked about to uh, new languages that we're doing on the forum, that's funded by google.org, so we appreciate that. Um, we're also hoping to expand to new languages on the forum and, and stay tuned, we'll have more announcements about that. ICFJ is about uh, 40 so people here in, in Washington, but we have many people working all over the world, uh, helping us uh, you know, carry out our mission. Knight Fellows, for example, we run a program funded by the Knight Foundation called the Knight International Journalism Fellows, where we have people working on long-term projects in countries all over the world, especially around digital technology and how media can better use digital tools to get information. So that can be everything from data journalism to digital security to sustainability for digital media organizations. Thank you. So let's take a look at that Facebook uh, group, right? That's what the, the main forum is. Right. And how did you decide to use Facebook and how does it work? Well, I'll start uh, with how, why we decided to use Facebook, and then I'll let Stella tell you more about how it works. We, really, we decided to go where people are. Um, you know, we, we could create something different where people have to create a new platform that they're going to or, or one that they may not be as accustomed to. But most of the journalists that we're working with are already on Facebook. So we really wanted to make it easy for people. So that's why we chose Facebook. And Stella, why don't you talk a little bit about what you can do on the forum? And I just yeah. want to show the numbers too. Look at that, very impressive that you launched a month ago and look at these numbers. Uh, so you can talk us through those too, please, Stella. Yeah, absolutely. So when we launched, we kind of decided to like have a, a webinar series and we started initially, our launch week I believe had five. And we realized that was quite a lot, so we brought it down to four. So we've been hosting about on average four weekly webinars, three in English, one in Spanish, because we have tons of reporters from Latin America in the forum as well. And you know, we have now have over 2,500 members in the forum from 100 countries. And now that we're expanding into French, Portuguese, and Spanish, we're creating also sort of these separate forum groups just in these languages. Now we're up to four languages for the forum. And it's pretty easy to join. You just search ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum on Facebook and you'll find the group. Now we have kept the group locked. So we actually approve applications for members coming in. And the reason for that is we were really concerned about disinformation agents or you know potential misinformation bots entering into the group. So we wanted to do our best to filter them and keep them out of the group and really keep it to a community of journalists. But we've also, like, it's not just journalists we're accepting, we're also accepting civil society members who are supporting free press or supporting journalism in different ways, whether it's in safety or in media development. And we're also, of course, accepting health experts and doctors who are working in various different countries who can be part of the conversation in the discussion group with journalists. And we have events on the page. So if you go there and click events, you'll actually see our upcoming webinars for next week that you could people can register for. We're streaming them on Facebook Live directly to the group, but we're also providing them a registration to enter into the Zoom webinar where they can post their questions directly on live chat. In the video section, we have like all our recorded previous webinars that are being posted there. And so just, just to show, so I can go on Wednesday, uh, a story of uncertainty, how to deal with COVID-19 and data. I just hit going and I'll get some kind of reminder the way Facebook works. I can invite other people. That's pretty cool. So ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. That's a mouthful, but you can find it easily. And I encourage all of you to do that. And if you have a question, you can easily just uh, tweet at Stella, uh, S-R-O-Q-U-E and P Butler 50 and you can connect with them. So did you want me to show any other part of this? Go ahead, Stella. Yeah, if you enter into the discussion page, it's quite interesting. That's where a lot of sort of discussions, debates are going. People are posting ideas, posting their stories as well that they're doing during the pandemic. And one of the things we really encourage reporters to do is make calls and ask for collaborations. If you scroll up, you'll actually see a topic tag called collaborations. I think it should be on the right-hand side. Oh, there we go, collaborations. So there have been 41 so far. 
And it's a really great thing where journalists are kind of saying, well, you know, we'd like to like form this group or I have this story I'm working on, I need an expert in this or that. So it's a really great spot for reporters to talk to each other. And it's no longer them just getting an aspect or view from their own countries, but also being able to connect with someone on the ground in a totally different country. I love that. This is this is so cool. The collaboration part is especially exciting. And and here, for example, Vinod Kumar Menon says I'm says his name and he's at midday in Mumbai in India. I'm at present working on COVID-19 pandemic. Need to check if I, if we can post our stories here and then people are responding. Story idea anyone can use. This is neat stuff here. Australia. I see the Caribbean. I see Turkmenistan. Like amazing stuff all in one place. So uh, this is this is great. You've been able to, as you said, you do want to make sure you're finding the right folks are, are entering the group, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when someone joins from the outside, just to flag to them, they will have screener questions where we kind of, we'd like to get some information about them, like who they're reporting with, what country they're in, and why they want to join the forum. And, in fact, and if any of them have been through ICFJ program training before, because we've held trainings all over the world to help support reporters when it comes to like fact checking, digital security, um, even like hosting story contests. So we've done a lot of programming everywhere across the world. That's great. Folks, please continue to tag your friends. Please hit share right now. There must be journalists you know who would benefit from this. If you are watching on Facebook, you can also start a watch party into another group so that more people know and uh, hear this conversation because so many great resources are being offered to bring journalists together and, and to cover this crisis in a proper way. Patrick, over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of follow up on some of what Stella's been saying. I mean, some of the things we're seeing on the, on the forum are uh, you know, even things like journalists asking advice on how to deal with problems in their newsrooms. And these are things that, you know, could be even outside of the pandemic, but they're really uh, useful. Uh, you know, one woman, uh, for example, talked about being a young woman in a newsroom, a male editor treating her very badly in this pandemic, uh, you know, needing where she was concerned or worried about uh, being out there in the public reporting. And so she's asking for advice. How do I deal with my editor when my editor is treating me like this? So, and people are weighing in. They're saying here, you know, I'd be happy to counsel you. I'll give you advice. So that kind of thing is just really wonderful to see. And I think what, you know, what we're seeing is how important this is even outside of the, the pandemic. We called it the Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum because we didn't want it to be named after COVID-19. You know, we're gonna have more of these uh, crises coming down the pike. So we wanted to make sure that, that this is something that lasts, that it will continue. And ICFJ has really an incomparable network of journalists around the world. Um, we believe, we, we've counted, uh, it's not exactly a scientific number, but we've worked with more than 140,000 journalists around the world. So we feel like we've got really an unparalleled network uh, and and we want to offer as much as we can to the people in the, that network to help them do their work better. And do you find that uh, it's been hard, hard to find folks or just people just finding you because they know to turn to you in times of crisis? Yeah, I think I think it's it, you know we we grew faster than I think we thought we would. Um, you know, we're really pleased to see about twenty six hundred people right now, and it grows virtually every day. So uh, as the word spreads, um, you know, out, out of those many journalists that we've worked with all over the years, that's thirty five years. So not all of those are active journalists, obviously, but the people who uh, you know, when I travel, when I used to travel around the world, obviously I'm not doing that anymore. Um, but you know, I would find many people who had been in more than one ICFJ program. So uh, you know, maybe one that's about investigative reporting and another one that's about combating disinformation. So um, you know, we're 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 finding it not difficult to get people. And I think once we expand into new languages, uh, which is we just announced yesterday, and, and in the next couple of weeks we'll be rolling those out. I think we're going to be able to help even more people. Uh, terrific. And uh, Vandana, one of our producers, says this seems like a wonderful resource. I just requested to join, so we're going to try and pull some favors here and see if we can get her into this uh, into this forum. So thank you, uh, Stella. Tell us about a little bit about your background, your work. Where were you before this? And uh, tell us your story, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of 
ended up working with journalists kind of a bit in the middle of a career change in my late 20s. So I started working with the Center of Investigative Journalism in London as a volunteer and an intern. I worked under BBC broadcast reporter Andrew Jennings, actually, while he was working on the FIFA corruption investigation. He was the journalist that brought down Sepp Blatter, in fact. And it was a joy to work with him. He was always excited. He was teaching me how to sift through documents. I, you know, I helped edit the foreword in his book and some of the chapters and also got to translate a lot of Brazilian documents for him for his investigation. And I went from there and for a while I did a stint in Paris. I worked with Radio France International for a bit, learning how to do daily news reports. And then I got picked up by the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project out in Sarajevo in Bosnia and the Balkans. And they are an ICFJ partner and they have a network of investigative reporters all over the world in Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia, Africa, Latin America. And I started working with them and I spent three years there working under these investigative reporters. And I absolutely fell in love with like the concept of journalism networks. Um, I got the chance with them to travel to their conferences, to also go to the Global Investigative Journalism Conference. Um, and it was an experience kind of seeing how journalism had this power to actually change societies, that a journalist could put out a story and it could spark a social movement, or it could spark, for example, people you know, changing their government through an election. And for that, it really struck me that powerful people could be held to account. And if they have the right information in front of them, they can make better choices for their societies. That's ter terrific, thank you. Uh, let's go to Patrick for his story. <laughs> well, um, I'm a, I've been around a little bit longer than Stella, but uh, so I was a journalist at various newspapers around the United States, in South Carolina, in St. Louis, where I grew up, in San Jose, and uh, I always had a, an international uh, bug, I guess, and I speak Spanish, so I did a lot of reporting from Latin America, some from Africa, and uh, I started looking for fellowships. I wanted to go back to Latin America and spend some time. And I found the ICFJ Knight International Journalism Fellowship, spent about six months in uh, Nicaragua, um, working with journalists there, and it just transformed my life. I mean, uh, I was just so thrilled to be helping in any way I could. I worked with a lot of very senior Nicaraguan journalists to put on training sessions. So I would, I came from a print background. They, the ones I worked with came from more radio television backgrounds. And so we were able to work together, an American and a Nicaraguan, trying to help journalists in any way that we could. And there was just such a hunger for it. So when I came back to, IC, uh, excuse me, when I came back to the United States, I uh, went up to uh, Washington to give ICFJ a report on what I'd done. And they said, well, we're hiring. So uh, I've been there now for uh, a pretty long time, um, almost 20, well, a little more than 20 years. And, uh, you know, I've had a chance now to, to see much of the world. And, um, you know, I think uh, I feel gratified uh, every time, you know, every day in the work that we do, because I feel like I'm, I'm helping. I used to be in daily journalism. And we all know that daily journalism, especially outside of the big, you know, the big media like New York Times and Washington Post are really struggling. And so I see so many of my colleagues from those days who are, are you know, having a real rough time. And so I feel like I've, I'm able to help journalists around the world. I haven't left the profession, uh, but uh, I've survived kind of the, the worst of what it's like to be at a daily newspaper right now. And I think, Patrick, uh, that there are aspects of this crisis that are hitting journalists at the small U.S. newspapers yeah. in ways that people aren't aware of. And uh, so thank you for... Uh, sharing. And by the way, I, I've known you for a long time, but I learned some aspects of your story that I didn't know before. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, folks, if you're watching right now, you're we're having a really important conversation with two fabulous folks who are helping journalists around the world. We love to see folks who are doing that. And you're we're talking to Stella and Patrick from ICFJ. And please be sure to follow them on Twitter. I'm giving you all their contacts right now on the screen. P Butler 50, Stella S R O Q U E at ICFJ at IJNet. And this is your chance to ask them questions about any aspect of their work. And I want to ask uh, both of you, what is the hardest part about trying to be an international journalist covering COVID-19? I know it varies country to country, but what are the stories you've heard? What has struck with you? What is, and what will remain after all the time has passed when you look back? Uh, one of the things I'm encouraging journalists especially is 
that when we lived through 9-11 and we lived through Fukushima or the Mumbai attacks, write down things, save our digital artifacts, mm -hmm. because these stories, even though they seem to be the most important, biggest things in the world at the moment, that these two, we hope, will pass. And then you may have trouble remembering that. So what are things, uh, let's start with you, Stella. What are things that you will remember 20 years from now from doing this? And then we'll go to Patrick. I think one of the more interesting sort of aspects of the story is how journalists are going about reporting from home. And I've heard different stories from different reporters. We made a call on the group about what is a day in the life like for you as a journalist right now during this pandemic, given like stay at home orders, lockdowns, how are they going about their reporting? And I think like maybe many of us in the developed world are very lucky because we have steady internet connections, steady communications. But for example, we heard back from a journalist in Liberia who told us, well, I'm suffering power outages and this is making it really difficult to file a story every day, but regardless, I'm still reaching out to people where I can by phone, getting interviews and, you know, putting out the story like when the power is back on. Other stories that we've heard have been people saying, well, you know, I'm a working mother, I'm a journalist. There was a freelancer in Italy who gave us that story. And she said, you know, I have to share my computer with my, my children, you know, in order for them to get their schooling done via the internet, but I still need to get up at 4 a.m. every day, make sure like I get my story like typed and filed because she's reporting actually to a paper out in Indonesia while she's reporting from Italy, which has suffered quite badly with this crisis. Or another reporter in Pakistan who told us, I am up till two in the morning keeping track of like developments going on with my government and the initiatives they're taking in their public health response and making sure that my entire news team is informed in advance every single morning. So to hear this, like really, it really brings home the determination these reporters have, not just to get the right information out to their publics, but the fact that they really take their jobs as not just like, like work, it's a vocation to them and it's a calling and it's something that they feel very deeply about, that they feel that regardless of the challenges they're facing, they have to be informing their publics. You're absolutely right. I want to remind folks that you can support ICFJ right now by going to icfj.org. They have a nice big donate button. Uh, tell us what happens to the money if we donate, Patrick. Well, we uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is that the organizations that rate uh, nonprofit organizations give us their highest marks, like Charity Navigator and, and organizations like that. Uh, we really, yeah, you can see down there their 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 mark of of quality. So you can be assured that any money that you give to us is going to go to support the mission of helping journalists around the world. And and the mission isn't just helping journalists; it's therefore helping societies because we believe that again, if you have better journalism, you're going to have improvements in everything from health to, uh, you know, better governance. So, um, yeah, but thank you for that plug, Sri. That's that's very good of you. And, and we really appreciate the support. And uh, we're also looking at the website here. You had a user generated footage, AR, video lenses, wearable journalism. These are some of the topics that these folks did on covering 19 masterclass highlights. This is such high quality work and such important topics that uh, uh, that people can uh, check out. So I, I'm, I'm really glad that people are, are, are able to do that. So please check it out. Now let's hear Patrick's story of what will you remember, Patrick, 20 years from now about this crisis? Yeah, I, before I do that, I just wanted to say thank you for pointing out that particular webinar yesterday that was with the two trainers, Yusuf and Sumeya uh, Omar, who are just amazing, this incredible energy that they have on how to use user-generated content in your reporting. If you're stuck at home, you can't be out in the streets filming, but there are lots of things that you can do using uh, user-generated content, using uh, new lenses that you can use platforms. So I, you know, these, the, as, as Stella said earlier, all these webinars are available to you. Just go to the, to the website, you can watch them or you can read highlights of them. So, um, so thank you for pointing that one out. But um, yeah, in terms of, you know, the things that I see on the forum and in talking to journalists and the, the biggest issues that they're dealing with and, and something that I am afraid is going to stick with us for many years to come is that many governments are using the pandemic as a way to clamp down on journalism, on freedom of expression. And that is a big concern for all of us, not just journalists, but 
all of society. Um, we're seeing that in countries around the world where governments are saying, uh, you know, we have to control, uh, you know, the, the, that term that we that I frankly hate to use fake news, but they use it all the time um, as a as a way of saying we're justified in controlling what our journalists, what media in our countries are doing. Uh, Sri, you're very familiar with the situation in India, where the government has basically said media organizations must show, must tell the government's official story. Now, that doesn't mean they can't do other reporting, or at least you know they they haven't said they can't do other reporting. But it's it's a big problem when when you are forced to run the government line. And uh, and 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 again, the question is, uh, what happens when the pandemic is over? And we fear that many governments are are just going to not go back to the old ways and they're just going to say well we we put these controls on media in place we're going to keep them um so from brazil to india to hungary to philippines we're just seeing all kinds of attempts by the governments to uh to control what the media are doing and we've done a lot of webinars on that topic too so that's uh one of the things that i fear will stay with us all after this is over so we all have to i think everybody journalists and uh, their audiences have to be aware of this and have to, you know, really call on their governments to uh, to let journalists do their work because it's never been more important. Look at Courtney uh, responding right away. That's a great point. Concerns around governments controlling journalists and this pandemic. Very, very important. So thank you. And you do a lot of other things apart from uh, healthcare reporting. You have media okay. innovation, investigative reporting, global exchanges, specialty journalism and diversity programs. Talk about, let's start with diversity programs. Sure, well, we, we do believe it's really important that new voices are getting into the media, um, you know, and, and it varies from country to country. In, in the United States, it may be racial and ethnic minorities who are not properly represented in our media. Women pretty much everywhere in the world uh, need to be better represented. In other countries, it may be religious minorities, it may be LGBTQ communities. So we, we definitely have a lot of emphasis on bringing new voices into the media. Uh, speaking of gender, women, uh, one of our projects started with our partner, Code for Africa in Africa, is a project called WANA Data, where we have been training women uh, journalists throughout Africa. Well, not throughout, but especially in, in uh, a number of the biggest countries of Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, Ghana. These are countries where we're, we're building a network of women who are now learning data journalism skills and they're learning uh, then how to tell these stories through data. And remember, these are the, the jobs that you need to have if you want to keep, keep growing in journalism. You've got to understand technology, how to use data. So they are doing cross-continental stories on issues like, uh, you know, water quality and, and you know, fake pharmaceuticals, um, female genital mutilation, a number of, of really serious problems that these women across the continent are banding together to tell those stories together through data. That's, that's great. Uh, Miss You Graham says, cultivating solutions through diversity, and uh, we salute you on that. Uh, in terms of uh, where ICFJ fits in the, you know, there are so many journalism nonprofits. Uh, do you are, you, are you able to do a lot of collaboration among the nonprofits? And this seems to be a time when a lot of journalism nonprofits are under great stress. So mm -hmm. talk about that, please. Sure, we, we definitely collaborate with, with nonprofits, both here in the United States, some of the other big nonprofits that, that work in helping journalists around the world, like Internews. Uh, we're, you know, we're friendly competitors. We'll go for the same programs, but we love to work with, with groups like that because Solutions Journalism Network is another one. Uh, they're probably in the International Women's Media Foundation. These are organizations that we, we love and we love to work with. Um, but I'd say our biggest partnerships are with organizations around the world uh, in the countries where we're focusing, such as uh, Stella mentioned earlier, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which was launched in Southeastern Europe and is now really global, but, but definitely very heavy on Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Connect Us, an uh, organization of uh, of investigative journalists in Latin America. Sembra Media uh, is another great partner of ours in Latin America that works to help digital first media find ways to become sustainable, better, better support themselves in Africa. Code for Africa is our partner there. In India, Proto is our partner there. So these are the, the partnerships that 
that I'm most proud of is, is helping, you know, ICFJ has always had a philosophy that we do not open offices around the world um, because we would rather find the local organization and really partner with them and help build them, give them this, the skills so that, you know, if, we, if, we're, if we're moving out, they can continue to do the work long after we're gone. And look at these all these fellowships and reporting tours and things like that. Those these are fantastic. And we saw someone say that after he did his Arthur Burns fellowship, he got a job at CNN. So yeah, uh, that's, that's that's really cool stuff. That's actually our longest running program. It's an exchange between German and U.S. journalists. Germany is not really the part of the country where we tend to work the most, but that's that's the program we've had for the longest time. And it's amazing how the graduates both on the US side and the German side, and now Canada as well, have really moved on to, to great jobs in journalism. That's great. Uh, uh, Stella, if you can talk a little bit about some of the other projects that you see that ICFJ that people should know about. Sure, I'm more familiar with the investigative projects because I worked with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, but definitely connect us as well. And when you were asking whether these networks actually work together, yes, absolutely. Connect Us is an ICFJ partner. It's also a member of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project Network. Um, the ICFJ has run trainings all over the world as well to develop investigative reporting skills for journalists around the world. And so what happens, let's pick one of these projects. Uh, this has been running for, it'll be running for 10 years, it looks like. And the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, so you're reporting about organized crime and corruption in all these different countries. And so people can apply or this pro program, uh, how does that work? Well, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project is a platform of investigative reporters and their primary focus is cross-border reporting. So they actually create these sort of alliances between journalists in different countries. So there are different centers of investigative reporting. They're smaller nonprofit centers located in different countries, and they all work together on stories, whether it's on human trafficking, drug smuggling. Um, they're also now, they now have a COVID-19 project as well right now, where they're looking at who are the pandemic profiteers. That's, that's so interesting to see all of this. And I'm looking at your resources page, Patrick, anything here people should know? Well, uh, yeah, so I'd say the best place to go for resources is the IJNet website. Um, that is really our go-to place for uh, any kind of resources that you might be looking for, again, in seven languages. So um, IJNet is, has probably about 150,000 now um, uh People are, you know, unique monthly visitors and our, our newsletter that goes out every week on IJNet goes out to, I believe it's about 40,000 people maybe. Wow. That's, oh, we may have, we may have lost Patrick there. Stella, you're still here? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Patrick, will have to uh, come back into the program. This is the fun with technology, right? This is what's happening given everybody's on the internet. It's 745 in, on the East Coast. People are uh, getting on watching their Netflix, but there are, we still have people here with us. And Courtney's still tracking and, and tagging people. Uh, that is so great uh, that you're doing that. Everybody should do this. Uh, uh, Stella, what is um, the, the effect on journalists who are running into story, you know, while first responders go into crisis mode and, and go into problem areas, journalists do the same thing. Talk about that. What is that drive that you have seen now that you work with journalists all over the world? Yeah, absolutely. I think something, we see health workers on the front line and we have to have, be deeply grateful for the work they're doing. But I think the other thing we really need to also be thankful for are also the journalists who, some of them are actually leaving their house to report which, you know, I'm not big on recommending that, but, you know, some of them are still taking the risk to meet up with sources. They're doing it as safely as they can. They're trying to follow social distancing rules. Those who are lucky enough to have masks, you know, are wearing masks. But some of them who have kind of figured out ways to use the internet are also getting in touch with health workers and trying to get health workers actually to provide them with video footage, with, with stories of what what's actually happening in the hospitals. I think right now we really need to consider that during a pandemic, information is a matter of life or death. And a lot of these reporters, you know, they've really internalized that mission and they're very much aware of it. And they've really taken it upon themselves to, 
to get those stories. I think one of the stories that I saw posted on the forum came from the sixth, the sixth tone in China. And one of our reporters actually had an in-depth interview with a doctor who was in a hospital in Wuhan. And she did this amazing human story about his experience coming to the hospital, what he saw, the sort of the, the emotions that were going through the health workers' heads like in that hospital. And it's it's one of those things. There's a lot of these really human stories with a lot of feeling that a lot of these reporters are also catching talking to these health workers in the hospitals on the front lines. Thank you. And Patrick, we have you back. Uh, welcome back. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. No, that's okay. This is fun with technology. You, you remember when I right. was making fun of the guy who had that BBC interview and his kid came running yeah. into the room? Do you remember that? Now that happens 10 times a day. I, so everybody. Cool. Right, right. I'm, I have a dog. I have a dog right be behind me. I'm waiting for her to start barking at something. So oh, that, that's great. Our dog is very much interested in participating at the worst possible moments. <laughs> now they're the best moments and people know our dog from just seeing her come into all of our shows and these conference calls. So tell us about, uh, you know, you, Patrick, as you said, you've you worked in different environments and different places. What is this time like uh, in terms of work, personal life, family life? Uh, how are you holding it together? And we need folks like you and Stella and others at your great organization to hold it together because they have to help so many people. So how are you doing? What are some tips or tricks that you want to share with us? I'll ask Stella the same thing. Uh, it's a very good question. So, um, you know, I, uh, I live in a house with, with three other people and uh, none of them are <laughs> quite as occupied as I am. Two of them are, are young students who uh, are out of school now, so they are doing online classes, but they're, uh, they're, they're you know, I, I get to hear them outside playing and stuff like that in the yard uh, while I'm working. So it's, for, for me, you know, I hear from some of my friends that even if they are working, they're not as busy as they used to be because, you know, work has slowed down and uh, not the case for Stella and me, I guarantee you that. We are uh, working harder than we ever have because it's just such an important time uh, in terms of tips, I, you know, I think for me, the most important thing is to take a break. Um, you, you know, I think it's it's harder to do that at home. I a lot of my colleagues used to have a work from home day a week or and I never did. I always went to the office every day because I'm not that far away from it. And um, it, it, it so I found it a little bit hard to to just kind of say, OK, I need to get up. I need to take a walk. Uh, you know, and I'll I'll do that. I'll you know, have some woods behind our house. I'll take the dog out for a walk at lunchtime or something like that. And it does kind of clear the head and and just get makes it easier to then really go back and dive in and focus. One of the other things we've been doing, well, we've been doing a lot at ICFJ in terms of uh, we do a happy hour once a week, uh, but you know where we're all together having drinks. We'll do a trivia contest or something like that. We have somebody leading an exercise class in the mornings. We have a meditation that we've started doing. One of my colleagues' husband uh, does meditation, leads meditation. So we do that uh, once a week and hopefully people are picking up tips that they use throughout throughout their weeks, not just when we're doing it together. So we're trying as an organization to you know, find times to be together to uh, and, and, and not just focused on work. Uh, we do a lot of meetings, you know, I'm on Zoom or Jitsi or whatever the, the forum is. Uh, you know, too much of my day, but but we need to have times when we're together doing other things too. Uh, Susanna Sejas, my former student from ah. Mexico, says, "Good to see you, Patrick. That's nice." Yes, Susanna's a former night fellow of ours, a good friend. Yeah, she's terrific. And Susanna, I need you on my show one of these days. And ICFJ staff says, "Anytime is a good time for dogs to participate." <laughs> and Courtney says, "That happened to me, Patrick. Dogs are adorable but unpredictable sometimes." So let's go to Stella for her tricks and tips. I have to say I agree with Patrick. The hardest thing that has been from working from home is trying to make a work-life divide. I live in a small studio apartment, so as you can imagine, this is my office and my house in one. And as Patrick mentioned, we have been incredibly busy and work has overtaken like much of my life lately. But I would say that the most important thing for me is maintaining a routine. You know, everything is closed outside. There's no shops, there's no restaurants, there's no bars to go to. You can't really see your friends right now. But maintaining a routine has been the thing that's kept me pretty sane, even though I'm home most of the time. So it's like I work between X hours. At least I try to like maintain a, a time to like shut off. And then after that, I have a certain amount of time to read a book, to just be off the computer, given that our online lives can be 
the main the main contact to the outside world right now and then make time to like watch a movie or an episode of a series before bed and then kind of and some time to exercise if you're not I don't know I've I've gained 10 pounds since this, <laughs> this pandemic has started yeah. so I think I think all of us are trying to figure out how exercise fits into that routine as well yeah, and, and finding that time for exercise is important. I had a friend long before this, she was a freelance journalist, and she said, uh, when you work alone, it's hard. And she said she developed an unhealthy relationship with the UPS guy because she was ordering things off Amazon for no reason, just to meet somebody every day. And of course, today, the UPS guy may not be coming into your uh, into the hallway even and dropping packages and running. And we salute all those folks who are working right now not just the healthcare workers who are amazing, the frontline responders, but also in the grocery, grocery store clerks, the delivery yeah. folks, all of them, uh, thank you for uh, what you're doing. And we really, really appreciate uh, all of you being there with us and, and, and for us. Uh, it, as we just wind up here, uh, you, know, you are dealing with international, that's the main word in your, uh, in your organization. Uh, what are some things, and I'm putting you on the spot, what are some things that are absolutely common to every country of journalists and journalists from every country that you deal with? And what are some things that strike you as being different? And I don't mean language, but in terms of the way they work, the work style, uh, feel, feel free to dodge this completely if you're nope. in trouble with anybody. No, 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 that's okay. I would say that, that um, you know, again, it's kind of unfortunate, but the one thing that sadly unites many journalists now is that our, our business is not doing very well right now. Um, you know, financially, it wasn't doing very well before this epidemic. And, and now, like many other businesses, it's, it's struggling even more. And I think that's one of the themes that we're seeing a lot on the forum is people worried about their, their futures. Their, you know, how, are, how am I going to, what if I lose my job because my media organization is cutting back? at a time when, when we need journalists more than ever, or if I'm a freelancer, how am I gonna find work and, and how do I protect myself? You know, I, Freelancers are especially vulnerable because they don't have a media organization behind them. So that's one of the, the common things that we see from the United States where we're seeing at the local level, so many media organizations, uh, you know, possibly not gonna last through this. Um, one of our, Maria Ressa, who did a webinar with us, a former award winner of ours, called this a possible extinction event for many types of media organizations. So that's one thing. But the other thing that I think unites us all is something that we've talked about a little bit on this call, which is just a passion. You know, um, we see that in the forum too. Uh, you know, it's it's a dangerous time, but but we're united by this knowledge that what we are doing is so vital. It it really is. Uh, I'm you know I'm not going to compare us to the the frontline healthcare workers and who are just, you know, superheroes, but, but journalists too are, are on the front lines in many cases and putting their lives at risk. So, um, so that's another thing that unites us. Thank you. And by the way, Susanna's getting a lot of love from <laughs> ICFJ, from our friend Tim Sohn. So uh, she's very popular. And by the way, my father's watching very early in India, right. 30 or so. Uh, hi, dad, we miss you. And uh, this is what, let me ask Patrick and Stella who travel a lot. Do you, do you think you'll be able to get on a plane and travel internationally in this summer or even this fall? I don't think it's gonna be this summer, I really don't. I, I wish it were, um, but uh, I, I'm afraid, uh, you know, I've, I've seen somebody, somebody just, well, I shouldn't say it because I, don't, I haven't confirmed it. I'm, I'm gonna be a good journalist here and not, not pass on a rumor, but, <laughs> uh, but some people are saying it's, it's really 2021 before our lives are gonna get back to normal. So I don't know that for sure with this, this virus is going to change, and and we nobody can predict. But I don't expect that I'm going to be on a plane anytime soon. And and by the way, this is I think the most important uh, words that we aren't saying enough that I don't know, and that no one knows. Not even the same that Dr. Fauci or the head of right. WHO, or no one knows. Right? There's no playbook, and this all just is happening in real time. And uh, this this uh, week, I spoke to one of the top top experts in public health in Asia. And he said, I don't know. And that was refreshing to hear, I don't know. And that's, right. that I think is important. Stella, over to you, uh, your thoughts on international journalism. And also you can give us kind of your final thoughts for now. Yeah, well, I don't think I'll also be getting on a plane anytime soon. So I think, yeah, I think it's really significant to realize that there's a lot that we don't know about, you know, when life will go back to normal. But I have, you know, I have a huge debt of gratitude to all the health workers on the front line right 
front lines right now who are helping to keep people alive, and also to the reporters who are doing their best to make sure the public has the facts. And that's the most significant thing because in a pandemic, information is the difference between life and death. And it's really significant that the public has the right information so they can make the right decisions during a pandemic. That's that's really useful and, and a good way for people to think. So Patrick, a final thought from you and then we'll let you folks get back to your evening. It's uh, almost eight o'clock here in New York. And yeah. people are waking up in Asia, so I'm sure people will be emailing you. Isn't that what happens as they get mm -hmm. up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're mailing you. I do want to show you that Courtney tagged a friend of hers in Paris. She says, you're probably not awake for this live since you're in Paris, but check it out afterward. And we, yeah. we hope ICFJ will continue to share it as you have you on will. all your platforms. And we hope you send it out on your email list, too, because you have great reach around the world. We want everyone to see this conversation. Oh, absolutely. No, we're thrilled to be on this show, Sri. You are you have been a supporter of ICFJ uh, almost since I've been there. I you know, I know you've come back when none of us knew what Twitter or Facebook was. You were giving us trainings on staff about, you know, how how to use these new tools and and uh, we really I remember for example, you I think were the one who told me, you know, some of some of you got to keep keep for your friends and family. And then some of it you, you do publicly. And, and I've kept that. So, um, you know, lots of great tips that you've given us through the years. But um, it's a thrill to be on the show. And uh, we will continue to share it. I'll continue to, to visit and, and uh, tweet this out to all my friends um, and colleagues around the world. But again, you know, just, just the last message I have is just how important our mission is. And for people to remember that, uh, that if you didn't have journalists, you wouldn't be no, you wouldn't really know what was going on you wouldn't know what was true and what was not we can't trust our leaders in these times i, I wish we could but um you know we can't entirely trust them we need journalists to help us sort out what's right and what's not yeah thank you that's that's such a good point to end uh this part of the conversation on as soon as you leave i'm going to do this odd thing that you have to do in this kind of uh, work i'm going to reintroduce you because people are going to catch you know right now they're going to come in and then they're going to hear a little bit more about you and then so that when the replay comes, we want to entice them into watching from the beginning. And these are things cool. that you don't do, right? In a regular right. workshop or whatever, you just say goodbye and everybody leaves here. Mm -hmm. I believe you have to reintroduce people so that they can uh, they can know the great work of both Stella and Patrick. Both of you, thank you so much. You are awesome. We really appreciate your being here. Uh, the rest of you stick around. I'm going to do my usual housekeeping and closing Closing up, and uh, Rose as, uh, says thank you. Important show for journalists and everyone watching the story. Please tag and share this. Please follow our two awesome producers, Vandana Menon and Rose Horowitz. They're at Vandana underscore Menon and Rose Horowitz 31. So please do follow them. And thank you both. We'll let you go. Uh, have a nice thank evening. You. Night. Uh, thank you very much. Let me remind you, folks, of who our guests were. Uh, our guests were uh, Patrick Butler, P. Butler 50 at uh at uh he's the vice president of content and Com community and stella rock is stella s rock director of community engagement at the great icfj the international center for journalists please check out icfj.org follow them pete butler 50 stella s rock and at icfj and at ic ig ij net i'm sorry it's been a long week and uh, let me just tell you what we have coming up tomorrow. We have a fantastic show just like this about Im U.S. immigration. U.S. immigration was already under upheaval in the Trump years and now has been upended further by COVID-19. Meet experts who discuss the present and future of immigration. Ask them anything. Prashantha Reddy, who's an immigration attorney, and Alan Wernick, who's the immigration law columnist for the Daily News. We also want to do a big, big thank you to our anonymous donor who has sponsored this ad for Frontline Food Trucks. Make a donation, everybody. So easy to do that. And the money goes to Frontline Healthcare Workers as well as to the food truck workers. And you help support this uh, little organization, I mean, this little uh, webcast that we do. Uh, an anonymous donor made this. Uh, and if you have anything that you would like to support, here's a chance. Look how inexpensive these are. Very easy for you to support us. I really appreciate your time and energy. And don't forget my spinoff show on WBAI radio. So exciting to have this. Saturdays, noon to two on WBAI 99.5 FM, WBAI.org. I talk, it's called the Helpful, Hopeful COVID call-in show because we want to help understand what's happening and help people 
If you haven't been live on New York City Radio for a call-in show, you haven't seen anything yet, WBAI.org, Saturdays, noon to 2 Eastern. And again, I'm so grateful to everyone for being here. This is, we're, we're, we're so honored that you would all be here and, uh, and support me and my, and my work here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, folks, for, for being here. Sorry, we just had a tech glitch there. But uh, I, I just want to thank everyone for being here and for being part of this show and everything you do to uh, support what we're doing here. This is show number 35. It's hard to imagine. 35 straight days of lockdown in New York. Uh, please email me, sri at sri.net. Please tweet me. Please follow me on YouTube. That's the best way to learn uh, when my shows are on and to connect and see the archives. Uh, it's an incredible collection of experts. And we know that many journalists watch this in order to learn of new sources. So that's one of the reasons we do this. And also, if you haven't signed up yet, sign up for my alerts on uh, WhatsApp. Uh, this is not a WhatsApp group, which uh, can be problematic. This is just an alert system, so you know when I'm uh, live on TV on, on these shows. And I also promised if I get COVID-19, here's where I'll announce it first. And I, I know people got upset when I said that, but I said that if you don't laugh, you will cry because things are so awkward and so bad and so sad at the moment. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Susanna, love seeing you. When are you coming on our show? And others, if you have any guest ideas for the show, we would love to have you. I want to do a big, big shout out again to our wonderful producers who make this possible, Vandana Menon and Rose Horowitz, and our anonymous donor who made a contribution so that they could support a nonprofit you they loved. And maybe you have a nonprofit you love, and you'll write to me, and we'll help you make an ad. It's so simple to do. So please do join us. Thank you very much. 7 PM Eastern tomorrow, US immigration issues. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you.